And what's going on everybody? How y'all doing tonight? Thanks for coming back to another history movie with Mars. Tonight we learn about Factor Fiction. Of course, when we're talking about Titus Livius, if you guys paid attention to my last session, I spoke a little bit about Titus and how, no, not you Titus, but I talked about the man, the historian, the Roman titles. And we talked about how he was able to create his histories of Rome, but in doing such, he eloquently used a lot of fiction, or I would say more or less Greek mythology and legend, along with uh, many other uh, civilizations beginning origination stories to do his histories what's poppin whiskey thanks for joining man i appreciate it dude how you doing made it just in time to learn a little bit of history bro with the whistle i wet the whistle so without further ado, let's go ahead and get this thing started. I want to start off by reading just a few passages from Livy himself. And this will make sense once I do read it. So this is more or less what Livy said but in his uh, the beginning before he began uh, jotting down his version of history. Events before Rome was born of thought or have come to us in old tales with, with more of the charm of poetry than of a sound historical record. In such traditions, I propose neither to affirm nor refute. There is no reason, I feel, to object when antiquity draws no hard line between the human and the supernatural. It adds dignity to the past, and if any nation deserves the privilege of claiming a divine ancestry, that nation is our own. And so great is the glory won by the Roman people in their wars that when they declare that Mars himself was the first parent and father of the man who founded their city, all the nations of the world might well allow the claim as readily as they accept Rome's imperial dominion. These, however, are comparatively trivial matters, and I set little store by them. I invite the reader's attention to the much more serious consideration of the kind of lives our ancestors lived of whom were the men, and what the means both in politics and war by which Rome's power was first acquired and subsequently expanded. I would then have him trace the process of our moral decline to watch, first, the sinking of the foundations of morality as the old teaching was allowed to lapse, then the rapidly increasing disintegration when the final collapse of the whole edifice and the dark dawning of our modern day when we can neither endure our vices nor face the remedies needed to cure them. The study of history is the best medicine for a sick mind, for in history you have a record of the infinite variety of human experience plainly set out for all to see, and in that record you can find for yourself and your country both examples and warnings, find things to take as model, base things rotten through and through to avoid. I hope my passion for Rome's past has not impaired my judgment, for I do honestly believe that no country has ever been greater or purer than ours or richer in good citizens and noble deeds. None has been free for so many generations from the vices of avarice and luxury. Nowhere have thrift and plain living been so long held in such esteem. Indeed, poverty with us went hand in hand with contentment. Of late years, wealth has made us greedy, and self-indulgence has brought us through every form of sensual excess to be, if I may so put it, in love with death, both individual and collective. But bitter comments of this sort are not likely to find favor, even when they have to be made. Let us have no more of them, at least the beginning of our great story. On the contrary, I should prefer to borrow from the poets and begin with good omens, with prayers to all the hosts of heaven to grant a successful issue to the work which lies before me. That's from Livy's own words. That's what he 
he, he knew that most of the things that he was going to be talking about or writing down in his in his earliest histories were going to be. Hey, how's it hanging, Queef Beeps? Beef Queebs? <laughs> what up, man? How you doing? How them jeans? Uh, that's good, dude. I'm just doing a little history session, man. I got to get my history out. Got to get my history out to people that are going to listen. Yes, sir. I got my books. What's up, whiskey? Now, how's it, how's it been, Julian? It's a long time, man. Hope you're doing well. I'm ready to get back to work, I tell you that. Shout out to my love. That's uh, that's Julian. That's the great and mighty man bun of the world. What's up, baby? <laughs> Give a shout out to my boy here. Beef Queeves. Almost didn't recognize the name. I'll tell you what, man. When I get back to work, I won't call you no more names. I'll just call you Julie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Chill. <laughs> Thank you, my love, for being here. I appreciate it. But anyways, man, uh, I don't know if you want to stick around, dude, but uh, I'm doing a little uh, historical session for my streams now. I'm, I just, you know, like I said, I got to... Uh, hey, I met his, his lovely girlfriend. She's actually really nice. And she did confirm that she he does refer to her as ball and chain and gets away with it. So, hey... You know, to each their own, man. I wouldn't. I'm not that brave, but hey, respect to you, dude. Like I said, hopefully everything's going well with you, man. Good to see you. I can't wait to get back to work. I tell you that. <laughs> but as I was saying, man, I'm kind of doing like a uh, like a gaming historical section, and I'm just trying to spread the word of the ancient antiquity as best as best as I know how, anyway. But yeah, that was an excerpt from actually Titus Livy's words himself before he began the histories of Rome. It's, you know, like I said, he knew that, you know, the very beginning of the, uh, of his story was going to be some, somewhat fantastical, you know. But that's what the, uh, the subject of this stream is about today is discerning antiquity in fact and fiction. You know, you will find that Livy's own words attest to the hard distinction from fate and fable. But let's start with the facts. Let's start with the facts from archaeologists that have done the field work and, you know, was able to kind of re either reinforce Livy's words or Tacitus's words or uh, Dionysus of Halicar Halicarnassus or Cassius Dio, all the great historians, you know. Uh, so let's start out with the uh, Rome itself. Traditionally, Rome was founded in 753 BC, but even in antiquity, there had been many variant dates proposed, ranging from 814 BC to 2729 BC before Atticus and Varro established a conventional chronological. Uh, apart from some short lived uh, Chalcolithic and Bronze Age settlements, the first substantial habitation of Rome dates from the Iron Age. Believe it or not, it does. Uh, unfortunately, archaeologists still disagree radically about its date. Some would put it as early as the 10th century, while others roughly put it around 800 BC. What was the clear? What was clear, however, that there was two separate and distinct settlements: one on the Palatine Hill, and the other on the Esquiline Hill, nearly nearly from the beginning. I mean, so what they're saying is that the pretty much on one hill there was a whole settlement and then on the other hill was a, there was a completely different settlement I mean there were both uh, I guess Latins but they differed very greatly you know discerning from pottery to written word to the stories told or to weaponry armor uh, there were two different there were, there were differences in those let's put it like that let me give a shout out to these guys you know I got my mocha in. <laughs> I still call you it or ball chaining to meet her and help her beat his butt. <laughs> I can't wait to. Be nice to be nice to Julian, my love. 
stick around for the history lesson for sure. That's my boy. That's what I'm talking about, Julian. That's what I'm talking about, baby. Right. I'm going to try to play the game while I do this, but we will see how well I can uh, read my chat, read what I read my research, and then play this game here. So we'll see. Wish me luck. This is my second session, so I'm kind of getting used to it all. The early Romans were primarily a pastoral community, building their huts on top of the hills, allowing the herds to graze in the surrounding countryside during the day. They also cremated their dead. Yes, as I said before, my dear, they cremated their dead. They put little little coins in the eyes, they built a pyre, and they would set them up in flame, and then they scooped up the ashes, put them in the urn. That's exactly how I want to be when I die and when I pass on. I wish to be cremated in the fashion of the Romans. So you guys watch and make sure that's carried out because I know she ain't going to do it. I love you. <laughs> the earliest inhabitants were a branch of the Italian people, an Indo-European tribe that spread over Italy during the second half of the second millennium BC. The advance of Rome, however, was due to the expansion of her mysterious neighbors to the north, the Etruscans. Now, you guys are going to hear a lot about the Etruscans, especially in these first few sessions. Well, probably in a, a great many of them because, honestly, without the Etruscans, the Romans would have been nothing. The Romans learned, essentially, they lived, they pretty much grew up in the shadow of the Etruscans. They learned metallurgy from them. They learned how to utilize pottery. They learned how to build their cities. Uh, they learned how to farm. You know, you gotta think of, like, the early Romans as, like, backwood rednecks. Like, seriously, they, they, they knew only one, they were only good at one thing, and that was waging battle. They were, they are they are barbarians, essentially. I mean, that's the only way I can compare them. They were backwoods rednecks, you know, kind of a, kind of a, akin to a double D. <laughs> double D's my boss, but yeah. he, he's a redneck. Let's put it like that. So, with, with that being said, you know you're going to hear a lot about the Etruscans. You know you can't have Romani without Etruscani. Let's put it like that. Uh, <laughs> so sometime, perhaps in the 10th century, groups of migrants, probably from the Balkans, arrived by sea in North Italy. Some of them came up the Adriatic and settled in the Po Valley near Spina and uh, Bologna. Others came around the bottom of Italy and settled on the west coast of Tarquinia and other places. Both groups share a distinctive custom of burying their dead in two-storied urns, which is obviously related to the great urn-filled cultures of Romania. Not, no, not Romania, not modern-day Romania, but Romania. This was a, a civilization that flourished from around 1600 BC. In Italy, this culture, which absorbed the native population, is called Villanovan. This is what these, these early, I would say the early Etruscans were called, before they were actually called Etruscan. Uh, Etruscia, you know, it's, it, they're, other than what we've, uh, well, not me, but other than what archaeologists have found in, you know, diggings and, and scriptures and uh, tablets and all that good stuff, they were fairly enigmatic people. I mean, other than what you see in, like, you know, the workings of, say, Caesar or uh, Augustus, and, you know, they talk about the Etruscans a fair bit, but they were f pretty much after the Romans defeated the Etruscans, they're, they're pretty much never mentioned again in the, in the annals of history. So, let's just keep that in mind there. Uh, the, Villano the, 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 blah, 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 the Villanovans were, re were reinforced about 700 BC by a new wave of immigrants, probably displaced from Asia Minor due to the Cimmerian invasions, which were northern. With them, they brought new ideas, including taste for Greek and Phoenician artistic styles, new techniques for working metal and an aptitude for building proper cities rather than the untidy villages, along with religious practices and a sophisticated non-Indo-European language, which we call Etruscan. So pretty much the first wave of people came around like the 10th, to, 10th century to 800 BC. Uh, they settled the area, which was like in the Po Valley. And if you, if you understand the Po Valley, it's where Mediolanum is right now, or I think it's modern day Milan in Italy. That's the Po Valley region. And they settled that, they worked the lands, they 
you know, they cultivated, they created their pottery. Well, it was kind of mundane until this second wave from around 700 BC came in. And that's when they really, the Etruscans really took off. What am I doing here? I forgot. Oh yeah, I'm fighting pirates, that's what I was doing. That's why I got time to read. So this mixture of elements transformed the Villanovans into Etruscans. All right, that's where the, that's where they, they kind of mingled in and became the Etruscan people. From a simple agricultural people into an urban nation of craftsmen and traders, with a network of cities that stretched from the Po Valley to the Tiber River, they traded in their metalworking, deriving from the larger deposits of iron and copper around Etruria and Elba, and for the pottery. In return, they imported goods from multiple nations such as Greece, Egypt, Phoenicia, which is Carthage. Uh, more important, salt was an essential commodity in the life of the great Etruscan cities in land, and it could only be obtained at the large salt beds of the mouth of the Tiber. The salt road, called by the Romans the Via Salaria, led these salt beds through Rome and so up to the Tiber cities such as Volsini, Clusium, and Perugia. Rome thus grew from an agricultural community into a major commercial enterprise simply because the Etruscans were so uh, adamant about their trade. So if, you, if, if I was to compare the, the late Etruscans, I would, I would compare them to the, uh, the trading uh, connoisseurs of like Carthage themselves. Carthage was well known for its fleet and they were well known to be traders along pretty much the Mediterranean and Adriatic seas. Let's see what we got here. So that, that pretty much sums up you know what archaeologists have for the Romans or so so to speak the Latins, the early Latins. Ooh. A child was born, Calpurnia Lanata. Oh, nothing much has changed. I'm still building a fleet because I got a freaking. I got these guys sitting in my bay. Doing me, doing me damage here. Can't be having that, man. Can't be having that. Actually, let's make. Yeah, I'm pretty much at peace with everybody. I was I just destroyed a, a, the Etruscan people not too long ago, so y'all missed that. And then uh, Pyrrhus, I, which I'll talk about him later on in the session, but he was actually in Italy and tried to attack me, but I bounced him and I knocked him back to over to Greece. And he sued for peace shortly afterwards because he knew I was coming for him. So now for the fiction. Now for the good juicy part about the uh, what Livy actually detailed in his uh, uh, history of the early history of Rome. We look now to Aeneas and Antenor, two men that had worked consistently for peace and the restoration of Helen to Menelaus, and for that reason, when the city of Troy was sacked by Greek spears, both by way of fruitful endeavor and certain personal connections went unmolested to their fates by the enemy. So this is going back to, if you guys are familiar with the, the Iliad, Homer's Iliad, is when he talks about the Greeks and the gods and uh, their siege of Troy with uh, Hector and Paris and when he uh, pretty much steals Helen away from Menelaus, King Menelaus of Greece. Uh, this is, this is in that timeline. This is shortly after the fall and sacking of Rome. So yeah, the Trojan horse had already been introduced. They'd, they'd already taken a city. Uh, they had already pretty much destroyed and raised it to the ground. So this is, this is preceding them. The story of Antenor was a brief one, but worthy of noting. After joining forces with the Aeneti, after expelling the native Aguant, Aguani, a tribe living between the Alps and the sea settled there with a mixed population of exiled Trojans and Aeneti, calling these new lands Troy and thus becoming the Venetians. So don't get confused with this new Troy. Uh, I don't know why the ancestors or the people did that back then, but the, if they were from a conquered land, they would, if they were 
exiled or they were able to get away if they populated a new land they pretty much took on the name of the mother which was Troy in this in the sense uh, it's now the land where an enter now rules so he called it Troy but Aeneas story is much more grandiose as he was destined to lay the foundations for a greater future for his people after being exiled from Troy he and his men sailed first to Macedonia for a new home Wherein he found nothing there worth laying stake, he sailed into Sicily to the territory of Laurentum. Uh, through their travels, Aeneas's men had all worth had all of worth lost. Pretty much, you know, they lost everything except for the ships and their swords. So, landing on the shore of Laurentum, they began to scour the countryside for what they could find until a native army under the command of King Latinus gathered to check the wayward Trojans' movements. So, these were there was two sections that was able to escape from Troy, and that was Antoner's men, and that was Aeneas's men. Now, whether this is true or not, you know, this is simply this is the fictional side of the story, and, or what I consider fictional. And I think Titus Livy is, you know, he 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 did the same. He considered this also fictional as well. You know, he states it in his early, before he even writes the the book. Uh, Where was I going with that? So just keep in mind that you know what what I'm saying here is pretty much speculation. It, well, it's a way for Titus Livy to you know kind of give the Roman people a very grandeur beginning. You know, it's steepled in you know you know kind of like how Caesar, the Julii, are the pretty much the sons of Venus. You know, this is a way for the Romans to reinforce their their lineage and I guess their soundness with the gods themselves. So there are two versions of what happened next after the Trojans, after King Latinus came out. According to the first, Latinus and Aeneas dueled in one-on-one -on -one combat and the latter bested the king. After coming to terms, the king formed an alliance and gave Aeneas his daughter's hand in marriage. Okay, I mean, that's not uncommon. You know, especially if you if you read Cassius Dio, there's actually times where there was duels, but not mostly, not really between like uh, generals, Roman generals. You you really didn't see too many duels between Roman generals. But if you see in the the uh, the archaic Hellenistic times, where actual you know Pyrrhus, he actually challenged. Uh, I think it's per per Perander. He wasn't one of the Diadochi, but he was a son of the Diadochi, and he challenged him to one-on-one -on -one combat uh, to, you know, to save his army. And after he won, he stripped the dead of the body, and you know, stripped the dead of his arms and armor, and they were victorious. Blah blah blah. You know, so it's not uncommon that that would have happened. Most likely, you know, they. This is a, a predominantly Greek world. You know, this is where. You know, Greece, Athens, Sparta are, you know, ma ma majorly dominant. Macedonia, very dominant. Uh, the second version goes, as both armies met and before the horns of the charge could be sounded, Lethinus offered a parley and demanded to know why these Trojans were on his lands. Aeneas told of the story of how Troy was destroyed by the Greeks and now exiled in fugitives, they sought a new town to settle in. Latinus was so impressed by the noble bearings of Aeneas' high courage for either peace or war that he extended his hand in friendship from that moment forward. A treaty was made, the two armies exchanged signs of mutual respect, and Aeneas accepted the hospitality of Latinus, gave, and he gave his daughter's hand in marriage. That's the version of the story that I do find far-fetched. You know, if you, especially back in the day, I mean, if, if you were coming to destroy my lands, I mean, me as you know, if I was a king of those of, the, of those times, and you were coming to destroy my lands, or you're scourging my people, or devastating my countryside, so you could, you know, for your, you know, for, for your benefit, I'm I'm gonna come at you with all spears level. I'm not gonna, no, nah, here, you know, bro, you know, cool, man, you know, I feel sorry for your plight. No, this is a vicious world that these guys live in. And I don't believe it, not one bit. So I, I prefer the I think that the first one was kind of a little bit more reasonable to believe other than the other one. Nah, 
don't know about that. <laughs> I, I just don't. I, I can't find it like that. So moving on. You know, and that's you know, what I say. I find it ironic these stories have any has come to be in Italy far fetched. Not so much in being in Italy, that could have possibly happened, but the sudden capitulation of a king on his lands to extend friendship to those who would seek otherwise to destroy them. However, think not of the massive armies of the later Roman military or armies of the Normans in England. During those early times, there was likely a few hundred men at any given time to do combat, unlike the pitched battles of countless thousands. And that's that's actually historical. You know the early Hellenistic people. They when they went to when they went to fight. You know that they they formed, of course, their hoplite. You know they were hoplites and they formed a phalanx. But it was it wasn't more than maybe 50 to 100 men that you know different tribes going at each other. You know depending on who ran first was the victor. You know, but it was it, was, it wasn't like they didn't try. And this is what I find strange is they didn't they didn't fight to really kill. They fought more or less to see who was the stronger nation. You know, the killing didn't really begin until like later on when like I, I really believe when Philip II became monarch of Macedonia and he introduced the uh, uh, the Sarissa hoplites, which was what is the exact same army and military that Alexander the Great took into battle. Uh, I think they're called Sarissa hoplites. No, they were called something else. Man, I can't remember. But as that's when the real killing began. That's when actually, you know, he went for conquest. He went to dumpster people. So, the Trojans no longer doubted that an end to their travels was now over and dedicated their time in founding a permanent home. They built a settlement to which Aeneas lived, to which Aeneas named Lavinium after his wife Lavinia. A child was soon born, a son by the name of Ascanius. As fate would have it, Turnus, the prince of the Rutuli, to whom Latinus' daughter Lavinia had been pledged before the arrival of Aeneas, was angered by the insult of having to step down in favor of a stranger and made war on both the Latins and Trojans. Latinus, Latinus was killed during the war, but Aeneas carried the day. Turnus was defeated in battle and sought out King Mezentius of the rich and powerful Etruscan city of Car whom also was not pleased with the new settlement springing from the ground and obliged Turnus in aiding him with an army to rid themselves of the combined forces of Aeneas and the, the Trojans and the Latins. Aeneas, in honor of Latinus, of Latinus, conferred the remaining Trojans to that of the Latins and as one took the fight to Turnus and Mezentius, defeating them in that battle as well. Thus, the long conflict between the Etruscans began until the untimely destruction of a once great nation under the heel of the later Romans. So that is what began the long, uh, it was generations upon generations of wars between the Etruscans and the Latins and the Romans, or, or in the Latins and the later Romans. And uh, so you ask here now, you know, where are the Romans as of yet? Well, they're not, they're literally not around yet. The Romans won't be coming around until actually the the birth of Romulus. That is for another session. Another tale of history to be relayed, my friends. And that will end pretty much that session of... Uh, wow, well, like 30 minutes. That's what I'm talking about. It took me like 3 or 4 hours to do all this research. And it took 30 minutes to display it. That's what's up. And again, I didn't get anything done in the game. So it's now winter. So if y'all have any questions or you know, you know, if you guys are curious about something, just just let me know. I'll be happy to oblige, happy to answer. It. Whether it's from this timeline that I talked about now, or it's gonna be uh, of the past antiquity, which is you know the the birthing of the Etruscans to Titus Livius, I'll be happy to uh, educate you. I mean, I'm by no means like, uh, I'm by no means a master historian, but I think that I've studied Rome long enough to understand the time periods, you know, the, the reforms between militaries, uh, all that good stuff.
I think I'm pretty well uh, versed in it. So until then, I'm going to I think I'll my 30 minute mark. Yeah, I'll just keep playing until like the hour mark and then I'll cut the stream off. Because I can at least get some gaming done now. Like yesterday, I didn't get to be able, I wasn't able to do nothing. I read the entire time, but I was also kind of skipping. Why is there so many damn pirates in this bitch? Like, there's a shit ton of pirates out here. Let's see him. I'm gonna see him. It's the Fritz. You're a bot. See ya. Yes, yeah, I gotta get rid of these bots. This is a bot too. Yeah, sorry guys, had to get rid of these bots. You know. But yeah, man, history is uh, something that is like I said before. I think that everybody should learn a, a fair bit of history. I think if everybody learned, you know, ancient antiquity and you know, kind of where we came from as a peoples, you know, no, no matter what you are, whether you are no matter what, I mean, we all derive, our ancestors derive from one point, whether it be in Italia, whether it be in Egypt, whether it be in, you know, the Hellenistic time period, we're all from this portion of the world, everyone, at one point, that's where we began, I mean, unless you're an Indian, and you start off in America itself, I mean, you know, so what? That's the, you know, I think the, I think that what I was trying to get, I, think, I believe if everybody, you know, even though, even if they didn't, you know, really care for history too much, I think that if they at least understood where we came from, you know, the world would be a much better place than it is, you know, today. You know, we'd have a far more better understanding of, you know, of human compassion. We would be less prone to repeat history which is what we as humans do and I, I made a mention of actually I just wanted to read it again wish to talk more of this stuff in school yeah me too then I didn't learn I didn't learn any of this in school this is like I said when I was like four or five or six years old I got in trouble for a summer and my papa you know he he gave me a book about this thick you know of Caesar and he made me read the book throughout the summer along with doing chores and, you know, tending to the farm. And he made me read that book that night. So no video games, no games, no nothing. No TV. It was straight chores, work outside, shower, read. And I did that the entire summer. And I just, what I learned to despise at first, I actually fell in love with. And I've just been studying it ever since. So this is from Thucydides. This he was a Greek philosopher. They say they also reused events from their own work. Well, no, it it was one of the beliefs of the ancient world first expressed by Thucydides that human nature remains the same, and since men do the things that they do because they are the kind of people that they are, it was it is reasonable to expect that history would repeat itself in the past as well as in the future. That's from Thucydides. This is from a guy that is. Let's see, we're in 2022. It's one, two, three, almost 4,000 years old. You know, he predicted this in his philosophies 4,000 years later. And what have we done throughout history? Over and over and over again. We have, we have tarnished our people. We have waged war on our brethren. We have hated we have killed we have anything that you think that is negative and destructive in our world we have done over and over again the romans were no different the romans were absolutely no different hence i think that's why titus Livy, you know titus Livy did what he did because Aaron, during his reign in the augustian times he you know, he kind of saw where the Roman people were, were what what they were becoming. You know, they were becoming vain. They were becoming, I wouldn't say in a sense soft, but they were becoming just decadent. You know, he saw, even though that the Augustus had ushered on a period of, of a golden age, 
you know, he had stopped all the wars. He stopped all the civil wars, the wars between Antony and Cleopatra and Lepidus, and he had, you know, made peace abroad. He had still saw in their laziness, and they, he just saw the just a one a once proud and noble people turning to, you know, the whores of Babylon's. Let's just put it like that. The, the fornicators of the Mesopotamia. I mean, he just... he. I guess that, that was his... I guess the history of Rome is what he wrote. It was his way of, you know, trying to... get the Roman people of his time to remember the the good days. The, the courage and honor of a day's past. So, I mean... I get why he did it. You know, if I had the capacity to do history for my day... Which man, it'd be it'd be rough. It would literally take the rest of my life to do it. But still, you know, for me to get, you know, neighbors, and you know, the left and right, and the the Russian and the American, and the, or the Chinese and the Russian, to get everybody to understand, you know, this is where we are as a civilization or as a human species, and this is where we're headed. You know, too much hate. Too much hate, you know. That's just my that's just my insight on it. So uh, that's why I kind of really respect what Titus Livy did. That's why I like reading his book. I mean, even though it's just a book, I mean, well, especially the early antiquity times. I mean, a lot of it was fable. I mean, he had to do something, I suppose. But in the the later sessions, it all kind of just leads up to where. Uh, where you get Romulus and Remus, and you know, I said that in my last session yesterday was, you know, it, it, this is kind of where you get into the conspiracy, you know. <laughs> you get the Bible, and then you get the different religions across the, the nation at that time. You get the Greek origination stories, the Egyptian origination stories, and they're all extremely similar to each other. So it's like, what what do you believe? You know, the story of Moses was the exact same origin, origination story. The only thing that differed was Moses was a an only child instead of twins. Uh, Moses was, you know, he sailed down a river, uh, plucked by a farmer. Well, in Moses' case, he was plucked by an Egyptian princess or a handmaiden or something like that. So he actually went into royalty right off the bat alongside Ramses II. So I'm his... But you, if you, if you discern the the different points of that that differ from all the other origination stories, you'll see that it's nothing different from everything else. I mean, I suppose that you know Egypt was one of the ancient ancient civilizations, one of the very first civilizations. Uh, but if you also look at the Mesopotamian origination story as well as the Babylonian or the city of Jericho, where they were all pretty much around the same timeline, or the Hittites even. You know, the Hittites, you know, they worshiped a storm god, a Hatti, and their origination story was the exact same as the Egyptians. So it's like, who do you believe? Who do you believe in the end? What is the real story? Or is it all, is it all fact? Is it all fact or is it all fiction? I guess every nation has a way of wanting to reinforce its uh, its dominance in the world, I suppose. Don't know. Don't know. I guess in a, in, a, in a way we never will. All right, let's get rid of these dudes, huh? It's time. It's time to go, boys. You guys are you guys are ruining my my economy here, man. I'm trying to beef my people up and you're stealing all their stuff time to go El Pirates now I'm gonna get them where they go well they can't they can't take my any of my settlements they have to at least seize it first <laughs> Let's 
Let's do this. Get some more of those guys there. Actually, they can. They could probably take one of my settlements now. Which would be stupid. I think I got a good look at them. So they have... One, two, three, four, five. They have six units of Marines. Four, looks like light infantry. And then three units of archers. So, I mean, they could probably take Asculum or a, or, or a Minim. But if I face them alone, they're... Obviously, they're seafaring people, so they're going to be extremely good. The Romans in their early days were garbage at sea. <laughs> Hence why they had to actually, you know, the Romans excelled at land battle. So whenever they, uh, whenever they actually went to go fight Carthage, they, they invented the Corvus. Because the Carthaginians were absolutely destroying them at sea because they were such good seafaring people so when they invented the corvus it was actually a plank that was on the uh, the hull of the ship and they would slam that plank down onto the other ship and make the ships into like a land battle where they were actually they were able to use you know their their manipules and ground tactics on top of ships and that's how they won and took the uh took the day for, from carthage and of course, after the navies were destroyed, that's when they had the first, second, and third Punic Wars. Third being uh, Punic War being the last. So, I guess if I was to take anything from Rome, think of Rome as like, like I said, the uh, backwoods rednecks of the of ancient antiquity. They were like the uh, the redheaded stepchild of ancient antiquity. They pretty much they copied everybody. But I think that the only thing that made Rome different was they were able to copy everybody you know for for instance they took the scutum from Spain they took no no they took the gladius from Spain the gladius responses and then they took the scutum which were Gallic shields from from Gallia and what they did was they just they they reinforced them they made them better uh, the Pelum an army of double D's <laughs> yeah I mean, for real. But that army of double Ds eventually became the the most successful civilization or empire in the known world. So, I mean, you gotta be careful with the rednecks, man. You gotta be careful. They sneaky, sneaky. But, uh, you know, the, the Pelum itself, you know, this is... Rome was the only... That was the only thing that Rome came up with was the Pelum. Even the, the Lorica Segmentata, which was the segmented... Uh, segmented plate armor that they wore was actually taken from another nation uh, and modified. Uh, the Pelum was the only invention from Rome. Oh, the Pelum, the Corvus, uh, I think like maybe two or three other inventions. But they were actually, you know, they're on a long stick with a, a protruding spike. And they were designed to be thrown and hit the shield but when they hit the shield they penetrated the shield and they bent so pretty much they couldn't be withdrawn from the shield so it pretty much rendered the shield from the wearer and you're talking about decimation man you're talking about it was devastating to the front lines so you can only imagine what what the civil wars were like whenever you had two roman armies facing off against each other and thousands and thousands of pilums are being thrown at each other you can only imagine what that was like Oof. Whew. I wouldn't want to be there, I tell you that. Nope, nope, nope. I'm good. But, I mean, if these guys invade Herminium or Asculum, then I'll just raise an army real fast and go face them. But, like I said, I won't I won't manually do a land or a uh, sea battle. I think they're just too, they're, they're too buggy and they're just too, way too challenging. Like, it's pretty much, that's all it is. You just, you ram your ships into shit. That, that's it. And maneuver. And it's boring. I really don't like them. <laughs> Beef please, I'm telling. I just took a pick and show them that what you said. Well, I'm the one that said that it's pretty much an army of double D's. Army of backwood rednecks. <laughs> he'll be alright. He'll be alright. Double D's a big boy. He'll, he'll be alright. Shit, he should be proud, you know? You know? You know, uh, Beef Queebs is on here learning history, and I'm making something of myself while uh, 
you know, I'm waiting to heal. He said, you're on shit duty. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I still have a knot on my ankle. It's like, even after three or four weeks, like that knot's still there. I mean, I can, I can move my ankle around, I can step, I can go up, but it's like, if I move it a certain way, it's still kind of painful. But I don't think it's ever gonna be the same, man. Like, I really, I really hyperextended the ligaments in my in my ankle, and I honestly, if I didn't have my hand on that rail, I would have broke my ankle that day. Uh, no. Oh, I accepted it. Damn it! That's because he was back talking to me, so I kicked him. <laughs> Well, it looks like uh, me and Athens are uh, buddies now. Damn. So yeah, I mean, like I said, that's uh, it's pretty much the, it's pretty much, I guess, the the whole sum of my segment there. I mean, I thought I was gonna take an hour, but I mean, shoot, I guess I read fast. He had to put his ball and chain back on. <laughs> I was like, man, why the fuck do I come here, man? <laughs> what the hell do I waste my time with this shit, man? So, yeah. I think that we all have something to learn from history. Uh, I mean... Even modern history, we have a lot to learn from, even though we, like I said, we repeat it over and over and over again, but I guess that's such the way is, that's the human, that's that's simply what we are. We're creatures of, uh, what's a good way to put it, we're creatures of infinite probabilities, I think that's what makes us special. Yeah, he's saying I get enough from D-Bag and now her. <laughs> so, I mean, like I said, I think the world would be a much better place if we, if we all took a time to learn where we came from, and not just you know, the immediate history of, you know, of us. Is I'm talking about like the ancient history. What? What led to that, you know, because what would have happened if Rome wouldn't have, wouldn't have been? You know, how different our world would have been today? That, that's just real talk. You know, after the fall of Rome, it was pretty much the dark ages for everybody. You know, that, that speaks volumes to how influential Roman, the Roman way was. Uh, you know, look at our, look at our politics today. And I'm not talking about like left versus right. I'm talking about the politics in general. Whenever the the forefathers that created the constitution, you know, they they made a presidency in the in the fashion of Roman politics. You know, in the republic, not not the kings of Rome or the empire, but in the kings of Rome, the republic, there was two two stations of statehood. Uh, there you had your consuls you had a consul and you had a proconsul well, we'll say exact same thing as the president and the vice president sharing power one having ultimate power but the other power able to veto you know that was that was really good at balancing you know say if a tyrant became consul that was extremely good at balancing that out so I mean there was perks there's a lot of perks in what Rome did that we actually use today, you know, the alphabet, uh, alphabet's one of them, uh, the, the numerals, numbers, mathematicians, I mean, even though the majority were great, but, I mean, it's just, Rome had a lot of influence on our forefathers, they, they had a, they, I guess they had rom romanticized the Roman people whenever they, actually did the constitution itself you know if you read the memoirs of benjamin franklin and george washington you know uh all those beginning fathers of america you'll see 
you know, Rome played a huge, huge part of their life. I mean, they grew up reading it. They grew up reading Titus Livy, Cassius Dio, Augustus. You know, they grew up because those books were around. Or at least not the books, but the history of them was around. Very educated men. So. Well, hopefully you guys learned something today. Hopefully, uh, I was a little bit, I didn't lose anybody there with the, with my educational purposes. Hopefully you guys take something from, I really want to get Ephros because I want to start pissing Carthage off so I can go to war. I'm not sure where all these pirates are, but I guess I'm not, I'm not going to have a choice but to go take them out. So, next session is going to be pretty much how uh, Aeneas' uh, lineage eventually, you know, they, they form a place called Alba Longa, and the Latins pretty much, they assert their dominance in the Italian peninsula. And that's, that's essentially where that one's going to go. Uh, it's going to describe, you know, the... The sons of the sons and the sons of the sons, and, uh, and ultimately it's going to get down to. Well, I guess I have non aggression facts with them. Athens is Sparta, having them on my side is not so bad in this early stage. I mean, eventually they'll go to war with each other. But, but the next session is going to consist of how Aeneas's lineage and dynasty turns in, you know eventually leads to Romulus and Remus and uh, the Sylvian dynasty and uh, how Rome actually became Rome how it began so it's gonna be a good one I'm still doing the research on it but I think for the most part as long as I have Titus Livy and a few other historians at my disposal I'll be able to do it pretty easily yeah keep on selling bro Get up out of my straight. I need you up in here. Causing a ruckus. Causing a ruckus like Uncle Ruckus. So I got about seven minutes left on this stream here. Hopefully everybody enjoyed themselves. I'm glad you guys are all here. I really am. Uh, no, I am not doing that. Nope, nope, nope. You're at war with the Veneti. I'm good. They're my immediate neighbor, and I'm trying to have a buffer. So I'll probably end up ending this stream in about seven minutes. Upload it to YouTube. So if you guys get a chance, go check out my YouTube channel at Son of Mars underscore Furious. Uh, it's a beginning YouTube channel. I've had it for since like 2012, but I never uploaded to it really. Check it out, man. Just give me a sub. Or do you sub for... Yeah, you do sub for uh, YouTube. Duh. Shoot me a sub. Shoot me a like. Help me out a little bit so I can spread the word of the histories of our ancient antiquity and our ancient peoples and brothers. And then... Yeah, hope you guys enjoyed the history. Sorry, I'm trying to still incorporate the gameplay into it, but eventually I'll get better at reading and then playing the game and reading i'm really i'm really I'm, my goal is to try to get up to where i am here in the game 272 bc because that's where it gets juicy for me i love this portion of the history i love this portion of the early republic because this is when you start meeting Phyrus and uh the carthaginians and uh hannibal barca this is when you start meeting all these big like big names in history oh let's get them boy Hope my general doesn't die. Away with ye, pirates. Away with ye. Alright, my general lived. Good. I am going to enslave them. Gone. See ya. Uh, let's go ahead and rebuild these dudes. And then we'll go hunt down the other pirates. See ya. See. So, 
that being said, everybody, I'm going to give it about five more minutes. And then I am going to end the stream. So if you guys got any comments, anything that you guys want to see in the, in the future episodes, by all means, let me know. And I'll take that into consideration. Y'all's input is very important to me. See what happens when you take pirates out of the picture? Man, look how much my... Let's get some... Uh, let's get this guy in here. Um, see, I'm going to be using these dudes to run with my armies. So, plus three chances. That's a good one. He's going to be running with my future armies, so. Yeah, uh, Beef Queebs, I appreciate you being in here, bro, and everybody else that joined up. I really appreciate all y'all. Hopefully all y'all stay well, and I'll be back to work. Well, I go back Monday for another doctor's visit, and then hopefully after Monday I'll... I'll be back Tuesday, but we'll see. They're, they just call me today, want me to go do some more physical therapy, which I personally agree with it. I mean, I think that I can work, but I think that I still need to be able to stretch and like work out my ankle in the way that they want me to do it. Because like I said, there's still a knot there. And I'm not sure, honestly, if it's ever going to go away or, or if that's just the way it's going to be for the remainder of my life, which this sucks, but... It is what it is, man. I didn't think it was going to be that bad, but, you know, with me being in pain for two weeks straight, I was in crutches and everything else, so um, I am ready to get back to work, I'll tell you that, and get ready to move. So, Yeah, he's saying I get enough. Oh. I'm going to be reading all the old things. With that being said, guys, I'm going to go ahead and end the stream here. Thanks again for everybody being here. Again, I will be having the next session. I'm not going to try. I'm, gonna, well, I'm trying to take work into consideration uh, as well as move. But I think that if I plan it out right, I kind of just want to stream on Tuesdays and Thursdays. You know, that gives me Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday to actually do, you know, little bits of research here and there instead of, like, because, I mean, it, it is a great deal of research, a great deal of reading I have to do, too. Remember, uh, to remember uh, everything and, you know, write it all down and make sure all my, my I's are dotted and my T's are crossed. So, PT, definitely important. Take care of yourself. For, thanks for the lesson. Have a good one, Robert. You too, Julian. You too, bro. I'll be seeing y'all soon, man. Man, I, I definitely gained some weight while I was off, though, bro. Like, you see how fucking fat my face is, man? I need to sweat. With that being said, everybody, I appreciate y'all. Thanks to you, uh, Beef Queebs. Thanks, for everybody, for watching my chat. Thank you, my love, for supporting it. And I will see y'all soon in the next session. Y'all take care.